Okay, so let's start with uh, clinical part of bacteriology and I'm just going to present uh, this slide so I don't have to present over and over again. All microbiology lectures are based upon six objectives and these are coming from your book. So almost all of my lectures are going to concentrate on that and that's what the theme of memorizing and asking questions in bacteriology will be. Firstly, for any microbe, whether it be bacteria, virus, fungi, parasite, we'll talk about physiology and structure. We'll talk about pathogenesis and immunity, and as I said earlier, that's where you will see an overlap of your existing immunology information, and I would expect you to know that, so I would rather run through that. Epidemiology, again, I'm pretty sure that you are expert in statistics and you will be able to figure out why are you laughing? Okay, don't worry. So we want you to become an expert in epidemiology, epidemiology. and then again, uh, clinical diseases and syndrome. People ask me this question, we are not physicians, we're not going to diagnose it, so and so forth, but keep in mind that if you don't know the clinical aspect, you not be helpful in treating. Whether you are a physician or not, clinical picture best describes and it has more retention power than anything else. So you are going to see quite a few figures and pictures and so on and so forth. And the, I can tell you uh, right above, they're all for adults over 18. But if you feel uh, to close your eyes, you can do so. But definitely I wouldn't encourage you to eat and drink while the pictures have been displayed or you bring your uh, vomit back. <laughs> Lab diagnosis is important. And then finally, treatment prevention and control uh, is very important. So I will begin most of the time giving you an impact slide. And I would expect you to pay attention to it. That pretty much will explain uh, what is going on as a Medical doctors, we are trained to look at one thing and basically give our opinion on that. So we call it like a short case. We have to do spot diagnosis. Looking at it, get it done. And then rest of things can follow. So I think uh, you can also pick this habit. It's very good. Good learning tool. And uh, you'll see me using it. And I will also want you to pay attention to it. So... Those of you who decided to be here today, uh, they can get some benefit out of it. Okay, so let's move on. Now, <clears throat> what you see over here is uh, a tissue injury. So if I was to look at it, I'm looking at a tissue injury, a very extensive tissue injury. Uh, and then again, we want to see it's, it's a female patient. You can see with the breast tissue here. And then you can see uh, a lot of skin damage. A lot of skin damage. Very extensive skin, skin damage. And if you pay attention over here, you will see peeling off of the skin over here. And a uh, lot of erythema. So keep in mind when I talk of Staphylococcus aureus, if you keep in mind that it is there on the skin and mucous membrane, and this is a nasty bug, this is going to cause a big, big problem here. To such an extent that this particular bacteria, uh, though it's a cutaneous, is going to cause soft tissue damage, but it will be fatal, especially causing one of the notorious things that we talk about in medicine, toxic shock syndrome. And you heard me talking about it uh, in immunology as well. So a, a bacteria that looks like a very simple gram-positive bacteria can lead to a very fatal cutaneous soft, soft tissue involvement as you see in this case. So the message for impact slide is that uh, this bacteria is on the skin. It can cause tissue damage. We need to know what is it that the bacteria has in terms of toxi toxicity, a toxin that is released that will cause such a big problem. Okay? 
so staphylococci. So that's today's lecture, and again, it's a whole family, and staph aureus is one of them. And uh, as we said, we're going to talk about the journal physiology. I'm pretty sure you are familiar with that. It is gram-positive. It is facultative anaerobe. And if you look under the microscope, it looks like a grape, arranged grape-like structures, like a bunch of grapes. It has those specific enzymes that are causing that kind of a tissue death. And the most important that I want you to remember, remember the ability of uh, some of the bacteria either to use or not use a particular uh, supplement or growth requirement like oxygen. This is catalase positive. It is also, uh, it could or could not be coagulase negative. It depends upon the species that we're talking about. And what you saw in that picture was that this is nasty. It's called hemolysis. It is chewing up your red blood cell. It does come with a capsule. It produces tons of toxins. And when the toxins are exited from the bacteria, we call them exotoxin. And one of the most important things that we'll discuss today, that it has a protein covering A. And this protein covering A is the one that would evade phagocytosis, would not allow your normal immune cells to phagocytosis. So you cannot get rid of that. As far as physiology is concerned, as I said earlier, they are gram-positive cocci. They are arranged in cluster. They cause hemolysis. For you to remember, uh, beta hemolysis, and I'm going to explain that to you in a while. Uh, if you talk of S. aureus, staph aureus, uh, they have one particular enzyme that was causing such an extensive skin damage, which is coagulase. They have a protein A, and then they have some very specific, which is we call it species specific, uh, ribitol ticoic acid. Gram positive contain ticoic acid anyway. So if you look at the structure of gram positive, which you did as a part of your lab, you see, you saw the acetyl glucosamine residue, which is called a polysaccharide. So that's where we have a polysaccharide A attached to it. So that's what the problem is. If you do gram staining, which many of you did successfully yesterday, gram positive, you can see purple. And it's like a bunch of grapes. You hold a grape, so they tend to kind of get together. If you, was, you were to grow them on a, uh, agar plate, especially a sheep blood agar plate, then you can see from here that these are the colonies. And around the colony, there is a zone of hemolysis because it contains red blood cell. So this bacteria is releasing those toxins that are chewing up red blood cell. So you see a halo around the bacteria. We call it hemolysis. So this one particular is called beta hemolysis. Now, coming back to the impact slide, the first slide that you saw, uh, toxic shock syndrome. Again, since we have just finished immunology, so you know the antigen presentation and how can you bypass or short circuit the system, I'm going to spend some time on the major disease that S. aureus causes. So staphylococcal toxic syndrome, and I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, historical uh, you know, standpoint on that so you have an idea uh, where is it coming from and why is it coming from and what's the story, right? So you can kind of appreciate that. Now, this particular problem that we saw was coming from the market when uh, it came from female customers that they wanted to have a tampon that they want to use it for all their menstrual period for three to five days. They didn't want to change that. They wanted a super, super absorptant tampon that's going to stay. And you ask for it, you get it. They made it, Procter & Gamble, and many big companies make it, and they call it Rely. So they wanted all the women to rely on that, and which they did. And when they relied on those tampons, guess what they got? They got staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome, eventually leading to death of quite a few so in New York Times, you can see they're asking, they wanted to test tampon in Rochester, just what can you rely on? So can you really rely on that? Now keep in mind the basic principle again, 
what is it that causes pathogenesis of that particular shock syndrome? Now, again, when I taught you commensal bacteria, uh, I said some of the populations are such that you need to know, especially vaginal population. So in this case, what is happening is that you know from your basis of commensal bacteria that the uh, vaginal canal is colonized with normal flora. And uh, now in the normal flora, you have to know all the normal flora. And if you change the uh, distribution of normal flora, you may have a problem. So in this case, what is happening is that if, let me show you the next picture, will maybe will make your uh, life easy to understand that, that uh, the whole idea is that you want to put a absorbent material over there, and which is going to absorb blood right and this blood is the excellent growth media for bacteria so you are, have a normal flora there and this normal flora normally is there as a part of vagina which is open to exterior and in this case you block that so you block that opening with a super absorbent tampon and then whatever bacteria are there are going to divide fast and they're going to release uh, some of the uh, uh, toxins and also keep in mind vaginal canal is is rich with blood supply so you have all those toxins released in the tampon and then those toxins are absorbed in the blood go systemically and cause shock so that's the whole idea that when they found out that those young girls died of shock and they pretty much then found out that where is this toxin coming from and again it this particular toxin which was uh, there had a gene attachment to it so you remember this particular had c1 gene so c1 gene was there especially for staph aureus and that was the one that released that staph super antigen and then again it led to the perfect storm in terms of cytokine production leading to uh, uncontrolled shock and uh, death of the person. Now, if you pay attention to this uh, figure here, so you can see uh, normal uh, vaginal flora. So you can see all these uh, microbes are a part of normal vaginal flora. And this again, as I said earlier, is open to exterior and slough up, move on, whatever is happening over there in that uh, ecosystem. What you're trying to do is that now you have a menstrual outflow and you want to use a tampon. And tampon is going to block that opening and it, will, it is a super absorbent. It's going to absorb, according to them, whole menstrual period blood because women didn't want to change that frequently. So uh, that kind of uh, menstrual flow will go over there, act as a, a, a growth media and bacteria which are normally there, right, will start multiplying. So you basically, normal is normal when they are within their normal numbers. Normals are not normal if they are not within their normal numbers. So you outgrow some of them which may be responsible, for example, in this case, releasing uh, one toxin. You can see this star-shaped toxin. And this toxin is basically absorbed by the rich blood flow that vagina has. And then again, it's going to go over there and taken up, well, normal antigen presenting cell and T cell should do a normal function where presentation has to occur through MSC class 2 and the T cell receptor. But this one particular acts as a super antigen. It kind of goes and binds to the V region of this attachment. Fool, make a fool of the system, short circuit it, bypass it, and will lead to enormous amount of cytokine stimulation, such an enormous amount of cytokine that you got shock. And before you find out, it's too late. So uh, this is a typical case for you to know and remember that what are the population of bacteria that you're dealing with. And you can see from here, since we already knew that uh, staph was already there, S. aureus less commonly 
then coagulase negative species, and then you have streptococci, enterococcus, and so on and so forth. But as I said earlier, if you remember the commensal lecture, 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 no, uh, is normal when it has lactobacilli, it has a acidic pH, and it has uh, a particular ratio of those bacteria that would not allow one to overgrow other. Now, what is the virulence factor that this bacteria has that's responsible for causing that extensive skin damage that you saw in that young girl who died? <clears throat> now, you can see from here, these are some of the toxins that this S. aureus produces. And these toxins are called lytic toxin because remember bacteria are releasing those toxin causing tissue death and by tissue death I mean cell death if the cell dies it gets infected and then again toxins are released and they are absorbed into circulation so you can see it's going to go after all those different components of our skin like protein fats lipid by uh, membrane by lipid membranes you have alpha toxin uh, beta toxin, gamma toxin, and so on and so forth. And some of them are even uh, acting on leukocytes. So this bacteria has these toxins that will kill not only your skin tissue but also your cells, such important cells like neutrophils. Then you have hydrolytic enzyme because the skin is tough, so the bacteria has to release those hydrolytic enzyme to chew up the skin. And as I just said, protein A is very important because uh, that basically will make them avoid phagocytosis because phagocytosis is a normal innate mechanism that should normally take care of S. aureus. Now, if you look at a typical gram-positive bacteria, lipid bilayer, you see that, and then they are uh, integral proteins, and we have a peptidoglycan layer, and then we have ticoic acids, basically these ones over here, they are traversing wall and anchored to the membrane. So this is a typical structure of a gram-positive bacteria which you saw in this case. Okay, now <clears throat> epidemiology is important because we know where this bacteria, we need to know where this bacteria is coming from and how is it spread, how is it transferred, how, what are the risk factors and your book Murray has done a good job, it make your life easy that uh, it has made a tables for that. So that's your uh, cramming tables. So you can see uh, staph or yes, it's a normal flora on human skin and mucosal surfaces. It's already there. And this organism can survive on dry surfaces for a long period. And the reason is, if I was to ask you, why is it that they survive uh, on dry surfaces for a long period? And the answer is because they have a very thick peptidoglycan layer and they don't have an outer membrane. And which bacteria has an outer membrane? Gram negative has an outer membrane, okay? Now the question is that uh, if that particular patient that you saw in the first slide was to be admitted in hospital, what are the chances that you're gonna get this from her? Well, you can see that it can happen, person to person spread. It could be a direct contact or you get exposure to contaminated fomites. Fomites are those things that come in contact with the patient, like linen, clothing, and so on and so forth. So if you are working in a hospital and you see a patient, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, so on and so forth, they all are vulnerable because they work in that system. So they have to be careful uh, when they are, they are dealing with that kind of uh, personal items of that patients. Now, what are the risk item, risk factors? So if they are there normally on the skin and mucos mucosal membrane, remember a general rule, which I told you in commensal lecture. If there is a cut, abrasion, an injury to skin and mucous membrane, so now this normal bacterial flora will not remain normal, but it will become a risk factor and will get into you. And that may happen you, if you have a splinter, suture, prosthesis, and catheter, anything that goes through your openings, anything that punctures you, anything that they do you uh, in the hospital with compromise your skin and mucous membrane, you are at risk. And again, uh, if you use overzealous use of antibiotics, as a rule, if you suppress normal flora, 
you're going to allow some of these nasty bacteria to outgrow. Okay, so uh, the whole idea is that we are protected from the environment, whether it be classroom, workplace, hospital, and so on and so forth, uh, by skin and mucous membranes. You want to make sure that these are properly taken care of. Now, uh, this slide shows you the normal openings in the mucosa where this bacteria can travel and cause problem. And again, you can see uh, urogenital region, rectal, uh, airways, and digestive tract. So these are like normal uh, openings that you can allow bacteria. Some of, some of us uh, are carriers. We don't get infected ourselves by this particular bacteria like S. aureus, but we carry them in our nares. In nares. So what may happen is that we give on, keep on giving it to others, shedding, we call it shedding. Right? You can find out, people can find out if you are a nasal carrier or not, especially if it's repetitive. Or if there is an injury, very common thing that you normally see in uh, these cases is that abscesses and boils, anything to do with the skin. And then again, I already gave you an example for this uh, tampon story, staph superantigen. So staph superantigen is the is the killer here. Now, if you look at what type of diseases staph is very common. You go to hospital, they're going to say staph and strep. Staph and strep. It's so common there. But you, if you look at uh, the whole scenario, what possible diseases are caused. So you can see from here uh, a list from top to bottom. So you can see if you go on the top, endocarditis, infection of the heart. You can get skin infection, we call scalded skin syndrome. That's why you saw in that young girl peeling off the skin. You can get pneumonia. You can get uh, cephalococcal food poisoning. You can actually eat. If they were to put a catheter in you, you may get a catheter infection. I already gave you example for toxic shock syndrome where a tampon and vaginal flora was responsible for that. You may get tons of cutaneous infections I'm going to talk about today. And then again, you can also get septic arthritis. So you can see from this picture that this particular bacteria can basically compromise or challenge most of our organs. Right? In systemic uh, microbiology, when we say, ask you this question, what are the causes of endocarditis? What are the causes of septic endocarditis? Well, S. aureus is one of them. But remember, when you ask you this question, we want to, you to know what will be number one cause of. So that's like prevalence. Prevalence means like a ranking for that. So of course, depending upon this statistics, you can see from here, if you were to culture a typical case for septic arthritis, and find out how many times that infection is coming from S. aureus. So you will see, like for example, in this case, four plus, this means more than 90%. So if you see a person with a swollen joint, with an infected joint, and you wanna do a aspirate and find out what microorganism is responsible for that, 90% of the time is gonna be S. aureus. That's what it shows over here, okay? If you were to look for uh, toxic shock syndrome and want to look for uh, vaginal discharge, you want to do a, a, a smear from there, more than 90% of the chances is that you will get positive culture. So these are some we call prevalence. They are causative organism and then there are prevalences as well. Many times we ask you a question, which, which one of them is the most prevalent cause or most likely cause of, for example, urinary tract infection. And you, you see we're not including urinary tract infection over here. It may cause, but that's not the number one culprit in this case. So the moment you see a boil, the moment you see a skin infection, I would start thinking of S. aureus. So that's what you have to have in your mind. And then again, uh, <clears throat> some of the diseases for this perturbed bacteria we call it uh, opportunistic infection. And again, 
very likely because your skin and mucous membrane are normally protective. If they are patent, if there is no scratch, no cut, no injury, you're okay. But if you give this bacteria an opportunity, they will not leave that opportunity. They're going to avail that opportunity and cause problems. And you can see, especially if you're in hospital. So you can see pneumonia, osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, bacteremia, endocarditis, abscesses and boils are pretty common, especially if you are diabetic. That's another question you may have. The moment you see boils, you won't see skin infections and some other type of infection and the person has diabetic, that is serious now. That has become a serious. So these are some of the uh, organic uh, diseases that are going to affect different organs of the body. Now, some of them basically are such that are caused by a particular uh, uh, part of the bacteria, like in this case, a super antigen or a, a exotoxin or a particular enzyme. So these enzymes, when they are released, they are going to go after your skin, go after. So a lot of tissue death and tissue necrosis is coming from that, okay? So the point over here is whenever you see pus, <clears throat> whenever you see anything which has um, tissue damage, the chances are, especially affecting skin, the chances are the normal flora, S. aureus, is responsible for that. Some of the patient uh, may be at a higher risk, of course, uh, it is not a rocket science for you to know that once you are in hospital as a patient or you are in hospital as a health care team, you are at risk for everything. You're pretty much at risk for everything. So it's in your interest, you know who, what are you dealing with. So you're learning this microbiology, immunology, not for, for patient's sake, but basically for your own sake, because it's going to be protective for you if you know what you're doing and if you know what you're dealing with. So infants, basically, they have a scalded skin syndrome. Young children, because they cannot take care of their personal hygiene, so they may come up with a lot of uh, infections of the skin. As I said earlier, menstruating women, if they are no, I mean, tampons are better than what they were manufacturing, you know, at that time. But again, possibility will still exist based upon the principle there. People who have intravascular catheters, uh, or shunts, when you poke a hole in your vein, you have to properly clean it. And sometimes you do see accumulation of pus there. If you do see some kind of an injury, they would ra rather uh, replace per policy after a couple of days. So they cannot use like one uh, branula or one inject injecting site for all the three days. So they have to switch around, clean and do all, quite a few stuff. Uh, people which, who have compromised pulmonary function, they basically, uh, or they have a uh, respiratory infection. Many times you must have heard uh, people talking about uh, secondary infection. So your primary infection is a viral infection, and as your immune system is fight, fighting that virus, that gives chance to bacteria to go and take over. So you have a primary viral infection, and then you may end up having a secondary infection bacterial infection as well. So that may happen, especially if you're old, that may happen if you're malnourished, that may happen when you're in hospital, so and so forth. The other important thing that you have to keep in mind is that uh, though it's very common as aureus, but we have a big problem as we discussed in the genetics lecture, MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus. So methicillin basically uh, is a drug of choice to deal with uh, staph aureus, but staph aureus is also clever. It has come up with a way to, to uh, resist your antibiotics and cause a major problem. MRSA cases are very difficult to treat and then we run out of choices that we have. Now, as I said earlier, <clears throat> uh, since it has a big family, a staph aureus, so far we've talked about staph aureus, let me give you some important points for Staph epidermidis, which is actually same species and a different uh, microorganism. This is also a major component of skin flora. It does not contain coagulase. So if I was to ask you what is the difference between S. aureus and S. epidermidis, coagulase is the difference. So that's how we differentiate. That's what we do the lab test for. It is also opportunistic infection. 
but it is not as bad pathogenic means causing more damage more pathology as his older brother S. aureus that's the major culprit uh, the previous one was hemolytic causing hemolysis of red blood cell this is non hemolytic so what do we care well we care because it it is an important uh, it has an important contribution to nosocomial infection so when you're in hospital uh, you may pick it up, especially if they have shunts, catheters, artificial joints, and heart walls. So these are some of the important things that you have to keep in mind when we talk of staph epidermidis. Now, <clears throat> if uh, coagulase negative uh, staphylococcus slime, and you can see typically uh, many a time what happens is that these bacteria, they form like an outermost shell-like hair glycocalyx, and it's like a raincoat. So they kind of protect them from rain. So that also protects them from action of antibiotics. So this is a very special external thing that they wear. We call it a slimy, slime layer, a vaccine layer. The antibiotics cannot reach there. So that's why you have to do manual cleansing of many things. If you were to ask, what are the toxin-mediated diseases caused by uh, staphylococci as a whole, as a family? So we discuss food poisoning because of toxin, toxic shock syndrome, and scalded skin syndrome. Also keep in mind when I say uh, food poisoning, what it means is that uh, bacteria has already released those toxins. That's why I said exotoxins. And exotoxins are there. For example, a typical example is if your sandwiches are made in Florida and they are transferred to to Chicago, so there is a, a, a line of temperature that has to be maintained if in preservation of that. So that kind of a frigid line is broken in the middle and that sandwich sits in a truck which doesn't have the air conditioning and that's where the bacteria in the, in the food start multiplying and then again you may have a food poisoning in that case or anything uh, which is out there old and people consume it. So there, there, there are quite a few examples for that where you break that uh, cold chain and then you would never notice it, but if you eat it, especially packaged food, they're always dangerous in terms of uh, causing toxin mediated diseases. Now, as I said earlier, uh, small infants, they are also a risk for uh, focal staphylococcal uh, abscesses small here and then uh, many a time what normally happens is that what i said uh, in a non-technical term as peeling off in medical term we call exfoliation so that is called exfoliation and basically that exfoliation is coming from a toxin called exfoliatin being released and you will wonder why do we need to know that well, we need to know that because even if you give antibiotic to the babies, that would not take care of their skin infection. You have to do something for that particular toxin so that you can help ease and comfort these babies, which may have extensive exfoliation and a lot of pain there. So antibiotics basically not going to be very benefit. What you need to do is you need to do something for this particular staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. And sometimes it really gets very, very nasty, especially in neonates. So you can see in neonates, uh, we have a challenge, whole body is involved. And also keep in mind, as I said, since it's a, also a vaginal flora, and many a time if the, uh, uh, the mother has infected a birth canal, vaginal canal, and the baby is delivered per vaginum, then baby's gonna pick up and then we may have a challenge. It's really uh, tissue eroding. So you can see over here, that's what I was telling you that uh, you can apply antibiotic cream, but you really need to do something against that exfoliatin uh, toxin. And these are some of the things in development. When I say for quite a few for you to write uh, drugs in development, so penicillin is not a drug in development. And whatever you see for your slides in PowerPoint individual presentations, whatever is in the book is not to be written in that particular area. It has to be new therapeutics other than that book. So you have to do a little bit of drug delivery search to get those points. Anyway, so uh, pus was a key word for staph aureus. And the term we use for diseases that are 
having pus we call pyogenic suppurative these are the uh, you know synonyms that we normally use suppurative pus forming so staph aureus is a pus forming bacteria pus so these are some of the common things that we see uh, especially related to staphylococci and you will see them a lot because you cannot run away from dealing a diabetic patient so diabetic patient because of their disease are vulnerable are uh, vulnerable to these kind of infections so let me give you uh, a rough idea i don't expect you to basically diagnose but if you have a little bit of interest in that you can easy pretty much easily pick them up uh, that what are uh, what are they and then again uh, <clears throat> Of all these things that we normally see for pyogenic diseases, the major culprit, again, for hospital and community acquired infection is MRSA. So we're still dealing with MRSA, not at this country, but it's a problem that we have world over. Now, this is a skin infection. You can see from here, a localized form of staphylococcal scalded syndrome. So this is called a bullous impetigo. Uh, again, as I said, that uh, all you need to do is just recognize theirs. You don't have to diagnose it. It looks like burnt off skin. So sometimes when a, you got superficial burn, you got this kind of, you know, doomed shape lesions that come and will contain something. So that's typical. We call it impetigo. Since it is like a doom shape, we call them bullous. Okay. Another slide, this is a staphylococcal carbuncle, and this is something that you will see a lot because that starts from a, a simple boil and gets deeper and deeper and deeper and get extension sidewise, and they coalesce to form this kind of a, we call it angry cellulitis, and you may see some of those punctums or holes over there. They are draining pus, very difficult to treat and uh, very common. Sometimes they w you wonder why do people have uh, their uh, feet removed or legs removed and things of that nature because once infection goes out of control, they may have to amputate. So that's, of course, you cannot amputate this guy from the neck. But again, it happens on the feet and hands. Uh, mm -hmm. They will definitely go for that uh, because it's difficult to treat. Okay, uh, now again, uh, a good example for one of the toxins. What you see in this slide is a uh, first thing that you will see that this is a cell, a typical cell. And this cell basically has a fibronectin binding protein. So we have a fibronectin, there's a fibronectin there, fibronectin binding protein. And then that is where we have those toxins, we call alpha toxins uh, from the bacteria, they are either secreted or inserted. So this is coming from now drug development point of view where you want to develop a drug other than an antibiotic, which again is a gram positive antibiotic, and you want to uh, increase the quality of life of the patient, you want to ease the injury, pain associated with injury, and you want to save a person from having a fatal uh, consequence or even not fatal but uh, losing a limb in terms of uh, amputation. So what you're trying to do in this case is that you would rather uh, help to stop this attachment of insertion of that particular toxins. So what they will be doing in this case is, remember I said some of the new immunological drugs will be to uh, either block fibronectin binding protein over here Right, because the attachment is based upon that, because there's a fibronectin on top, or basically uh, stop that being inserted over there. Because if you don't do that, what will happen is that this particular toxin will go into the cells and then will damage the cell. You can see that it basically uh, gets damage to the cell, not only damage to the cells, like epithelial cell, it can basically also insert into neutrophils. So you can see it being going into the neutrophils. And not only going into the neutrophils, but again, basically going into the blood and traveling everywhere. So that's the challenge that we have, especially dealing with alpha toxin uh, 
which basically is going to resist phagocytosis and then again uh, formation of a wall will exist and we have a fibronectin binding protein. So in this case, what you may want to do is, as I said earlier, go for the antibodies, receptor binding techniques, and many other drugs which are there, and they may not be marketed as such, but uh, this is what we have in terms of uh, helping out. Okay, this is a legend of whatever uh, we talked about. The uh, toxin as a poor forming toxin is gonna poke hole there and it's going to insert itself into neutrophils and again once it does that it's going to resist phagocytosis. So what you saw that uh, one problem is that bacteria itself and the other problem is that bacteria when it releases those toxins. We talked about super antigen, we talked about protein A, now we talked about alpha toxin, we talked of uh, exfolatin. So these are some of the questions that uh, may come and will come uh, in the exam when we deal with S. aureus. And having said that, uh, it may look uh, kind of scary for you, but this is a very good table, and you will see over and over, but you may, not, may start practicing right now because this is what your life is in future, uh, to know what are the diseases caused by S. aureus. And this is a nice table, I'm not gonna spend much time on that, uh, the clinical summaries for the staphylococcal diseases. So you will see again, it lists the toxin-mediated diseases, it lists the separated infection, then it lists many different specific uh, organ-affiliated damage. And then again, uh, you can see that it's like by itself a complete list that what can go wrong. The whole idea for this particular table is that the more organs are involved, will suggest to you that this bacteria is pathogenic. This bacteria is nasty. This bacteria needs to be eliminated. But also remember the danger, as I said, that uh, you have methicillin as a drug of choice. And this bacteria, since it has a lot of different mechanisms to avoid phagocytosis, it's got a lot of different mechanisms to cause diseases. So we need to investigate. And we need to find out how does this bacteria cause disease. That's called pathogenesis. Patho means pathology, genesis is how, is how is it generated, how is it made to cause such an extensive damage that is going to go for everything that you have, almost everywhere, okay? Some final slides to give clinical orientation. Uh, typical, you can see a boil. The other technical word for boil is frontal. And you can see it starts from here, usually the uh, typical cases the hair follicle is involved and then again uh, infection accumulates over here blood cells come over here and then you get an abscess and once it forms an abscess it pushes it up to the same hole that the hair was coming from and then many a times uh, it has a exterior opening and the deeper pocket so uh, the deeper pocket uh, is where the pus is. Sometimes it's in the superficial layers of the skin and sometimes it really gets deeper, very deep, like carbuncle, okay? Uh, pustular uh, impetigo, you can see this young man, basically it has, knows all those vesicles over here, and these are pus filled, and they have a crusted lien. So these type of tissue injuries are very difficult to treat and you will see them a lot and people will come and complain to you how long are you going to keep them on antibiotics so you have to come up with alternative plan you have to come up with newer drugs you have to come up with something that will stop those particular toxins and particular uh, you know culprits which are there in the immune system to fight with so you can see eyes are involved and this is again a pustular impetigo as compared to bullous impetigo which you saw which basically had this uh, doom-shaped outer covering and it was filled most likely with a clear fluid. But of course, this is not clear. This is a, a typical pus. A very common scene for diabetic patients. Uh, uh, you can see from here a typical carbuncle. And I mean, I've got my own experience by doing surgery on this kind of carbuncle. And I remember, you know, once we open it up, I thought it's going to be here in the superficial layer. And then we start digging out and out and out. 
in and in and we found out that it goes from gluteus maximus to gluteus minimus to gluteus minor all the way down is very difficult so you may want to make a big cut and drain everything is very difficult very common for a diabetic patient and uh, it's nasty it's really nasty uh, so it's more than and it's, it's a staph aureus and many a time remember if you see this kind of situation your antibiotics creams and IV nothing is going to work that's where the surgical we call debridement has to go in place how do you diagnose as aureus gram staining you all are experts in that right microscopy and then you can grow them on a non-selective media this means it's going to grow on everything that's what it means you can have a selective media like sheep blood agar but it's so nasty you put it anywhere it's going to grow or you can give a selective media like mineral salt agar sheep blood agar that basically we normally use uh, to grow them and the uh, final slide basically talks about treatment prevention and control that's basically something that you need to spend time on again the commonest question asked is that uh, antibiotics of choice so oxacillin is or vancomycin so you have if you have a penicillinase resistant penicillin so you want to use that or you can use vancomycin if it is of the resistance range and then again for MRSA of course this is not going to work so for MRSA we want to go for other options so these are the option trimethoprim sulfamethoxol clindamycin linozolid deptomycin and delphospritin these are some of the drugs that we have in, in the market and I expect you to know them and you should have it on your fingertips because that's what you're going to do in future okay the other treatment uh, for these kind of uh, gram positive infections is that uh, uh, you have to take care of the wound wound care is also important so as I was giving an example for abscess that has to be drained if it's a food poisoning you have to identify food poisoning and you t have to do symptomatic treatment uh, and uh, coming back to the major point earlier if you're working in the hospital physician and come in contact with this patient and you cannot run away from them you have to touch them you have to you know help them uh, just because you know that it's going to be passed on to you doesn't exempt you from uh, examining and treating them so what you probably need to do though is proper cleansing of wounds and use disinfectant to prevent infection you have to have thorough hand washing and you want to make sure that the exposed skin parts are covered and you at least uh, don't take it from patient to patient and do a good hygiene and uh, protect not only uh, yourself from getting all those kind of wounds uh, infections but you have another duty because you can take it from one patient and pass it on to other physicians can do so so they normally would wash their hands before they examine they would wash their hands again after the examination right and then again anything that comes in contact with the patient like fomites I said the bedding lining everything people serving them people uh, uh, giving them food, keeping people, nurses, changing their linen, so and so forth. They have to be very watchful of uh, these kind of uh, spread that may occur over time. Okay, so that finishes staph aureus.